بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطيب الطاهرين السلام عليكم and welcome my dearest brothers and sisters to this episode of Keys to Paradise with me your sister in Islam Mehwash my dearest brothers and sisters in the last episode I started to speak about the sins of the tongue and inshallah in today's episode I will continue to talk about this organ my dearest brothers and sisters the words that we say we are responsible for our words Allah revealed in the Surah Al-Isra Ayah 36 إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا Which means, one is responsible for what he hears, what he sees, and what he believes. A tirmidhi narrated a saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the companion Mu'adh ibn Jabal in which he said to Mu'adh وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسَ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ إِلَّا حَسَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he answered a question of Mu'adh ibn Jabal confirming what makes the people fall into hellfire on their faces is what they reap from their tongues what they reap from their tongues hence my dearest brothers and sisters wisdom entails that one uses one's tongue in remembering Allah, in performing the obedience, in ordering the lawful and forbidding the unlawful. Let us remind ourselves of what Allah revealed in Surah Qaf, Ayah 18. مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ which means the angels, the angels Raqib and Atid write down every word that a person utters. Every word that a person utters. However, it is known from other religious texts that these sinful words would be erased if the person repents. My dearest brothers and sisters, on the day of judgment, on that day, would each one of us not want to have only the good words in his record without having any sinful or ugly words for which we would be held to account? Thus, it is important to emphasize the matters related to the tongue our beloved Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he advised us in a hadith narrated by At-Tirmidhi. He said, Man swamata naja. This means the one, he, this means the one who adheres to lengthy silences except from that which is good, he will be saved on the day of judgment. He will be saved on the day of judgment. So let us now continue mentioning some of the sins of the tongue. And amongst the sins of the tongue is namima, tail bearing. Now namima is defined as spreading words among one's fellow Muslims with what purpose? With the purpose of stirring enmity and problems amongst them. In other words, a person transmits information from one party to another party with the purpose of stirring up 
enmity and hatred amongst them. This sin is the sin of the tongue and this sin is known as namima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispraised such people in the Quran. In Surah Al-Qalam, Ayah 11, Hammazim binameen. This ayah highlights how ugly the sin of namima is. My dearest brothers and sisters, in a hadith narrated by Al-Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, La yadkhulul jannah qattat. This means, this means the one, the one who commits namima shall not enter paradise with the first group. That is, the Muslim who died without repenting of his sin of tail-bearing will be tortured in hellfire before entering paradise. That is, the tail-bearer does not enter paradise with the first groups of Muslims. Rather, he is tortured first and then he enters paradise with the later batches. Moreover, my dearest brothers and sisters, this sin of Namima is amongst the reasons that causes many people to be tortured in their graves. <sighs> amongst the sins of the tongue, my dearest brothers and sisters, is Tahrish. Now this refers to making certain sounds so as to stir up trouble amongst others. Even if it is goading or encouraging animals just such as dogs or roosters to fight each other. If there is some tension between two people, some people, they make certain sounds so as to stir up trouble to encourage people to fight with one another. This is sinful and in Arabic this sin is known as the sin of tahrish. Now the next sin I'm going to talk about is of the tongue is to lie which is it means to say what is different from the truth. Now lying is for one to report something whilst knowing, whilst knowing that the truth is different from what they are saying. This is the forbidden lying. My dearest brothers and sisters, lying is for one to report something whilst knowing that the truth is different from what they are saying. This is the forbidden lying. If one thinks that things had occurred the way one is narrating, whilst in reality they occurred in a different way, then they are not sinful. However, to deliberately say that which is different from the truth, then this is sinful. Lying is considered a sin whether the person is doing it, they're committing a joke or serious. Lying is not permissible whilst doing jokingly or whilst doing it seriously. Now there are different levels of lying. Some lies are kufr, other lies are enormous sins, and others are small sins. In a few cases, in a few cases, it is permissible to lie. Like for example, if someone wanted to unjustly kill your brother or sister who is hiding in your house, then in such a case, one is allowed to lie so as to protect them from being killed. So as to protect them from being killed. 
The next sin that I'm going to talk about, my dearest brothers and sisters, the sin of the tongue, is to commit perjury. In other words, to solemnly swear to lie. Also, amongst the sins of the tongue is to swear to a lie knowingly. This sin is an enormous sin. On the other hand, swearing truthfully by Allah or his attributes is not a sin, but rather it is permissible. Swearing by Allah whilst lying is not kufr, but it is deemed as an enormous sin. The next sin, the next sin of the tongue is to say words which attribute adultery or fornication, zina, to a person or to one of his relatives. Whether this is done explicitly or implicitly with that intention. Now in Arabic, this sin of the tongue is called qadf and it is to attribute zina to a Muslim with an explicit statement. And this is considered as an enormous sin, a sin deserving of punishment in hellfire. Explicit statements, explicit statements are, for example, when a person addresses the other person and says, Oh, you fornicator, or Oh, you son of a fornicator, or Oh, you sodomizer. Okay? Note, it is also not permissible to use implicit statements, such as to say to a person, uh, to address them by saying, you are a disgrace, or you enormous sinner, whilst having the intention of attributing zina to someone. My dearest brothers and sisters, it is an enormous sin to insinuate about another Muslim that they have committed zina. For example, if someone said, well, at least I'm not a fornicator, insinuating by that that the other person is a fornicator. SubhanAllah, some people, some people are very loose with their tongues and they utter statements without thinking about the consequences of these statements. This is why the Prophet وسلم, he advised us to think before we speak, to think before we speak, because the bad word, once it comes out, we cannot just simply take it back as though we never said it in the first place. <sighs> Amongst the sins of the tongue, my dearest brothers and sisters, is to curse the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, I previously mentioned what the definition of a companion is. A companion is a male or female who met the Prophet وسلم, during his lifetime, even if it was for a short period of time, whilst believing in the Prophet وسلم, and then this person later, he died as a Muslim. Now this is the definition of the companion of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, my dearest brothers and sisters, the one who curses or degrades all of the companions, then this person is judged as a kafir, a blasphemer, a non-Muslim, because the companions are the ones who conveyed the rules of the religion to us 
and by cursing all of them, it would be like discrediting the religion. Likewise, the one who says that all of the companions were not trustworthy, they would be claiming, they would be claiming that we cannot trust or be confident in the rules of the religion because the rules of the religion were conveyed through the companions. Therefore, therefore, my dearest brothers and sisters, such a person, such a person would be claiming that the religion of Islam cannot be trusted. And this would be kufr. And this would be kufr. In Surah, Tawbah, At-Tawbah, verse 100, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He praised, He praised the early immigrants, the Anfar, and those who follow those companions. In the Qur'an, it was revealed, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ بِإِحْسَانٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي تَحْتَهَا الْأَنْهَارُ تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا ذلك الفوز العظيم. This verse, this verse means that the early immigrants from Mecca to Medina and the Ansar of Medina, as well as those who follow their steps. Such people have earned the acceptance of Allah and they accept everything that Allah predestined without objecting to it. Allah prepared for them everlasting enjoyment in paradise in which very beautiful, it's very beautiful places with rivers. This is the great success. This is the great success. Hence, whoever claims that all of the companions are dispraised would be belying and contradicting this verse of the Quran and therefore would be judged as a blasphemer. On the other hand, my dearest brothers and sisters, the one who slanders one of the pious companions, then it would not be kufr, but it would still be an enormous sin, an enormous sin, a sin deserving of punishment in hellfire. Imam Ali radiyallahu anhu was a righteous khalifa and a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. If anyone was to slander him or to curse him, then they would be committing an enormous sin by that. An enormous sin. Likewise, if someone cursed Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, or Lady Aisha, then such a person would be committing an enormous sin, a sin deserving of punishment in hellfire. So in other words, regardless of the prayers and fast that a person kept, if they did not repent of this enormous sin, they would deserve to be punished in hellfire. Note, although not all of the companions were at the same level, 
in general, they were in a very high situation. The companions never disagreed about any basic creedal matter. All of them knew and believed that Allah does not resemble the creation. All of them knew and believed that Allah does not resemble the creation. They knew that changing, change, is among the attributes of the creation. And this is why they affirmed that Allah is free of it. Allah is free of change. Allah does not change. No one amongst them believed that Allah resides in a place. None of them believed that Allah changes his will. None of them believed that Allah moves from one place to another. Because they knew that whatever moves, whatever changes, whatever has limits, these are attributes of the creation and not the attributes of the creator. Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani narrated that Imam Ali radiyallahu anhu said, Man za'ama anna ilahana mahdood faqad jahil al-khaliq al-ma'bood which means the one who claims that our Lord has limits, he is ignorant, he is ignorant about God, the one who deserves to be worshipped. Imam Ali, he said, the one who claims that our Lord has limits, then he is ignorant about God, about the one who deserves to be worshipped. In other words, in other words, the one who claims that Allah is attributed with a form, a size, or a quantity, they would not be worshipping Allah and therefore they would not be a Muslim. The companions never disagreed about these basic issues in belief. They never did. Moreover, with the exception of a few cases, the companions had good relations with one another, especially the early immigrants and the Anfal. And this is contrary to what some of the misguided people claim about the companions. One example is that Imam Ali had a very intelligent daughter from Lady Fatima. Her name was Umm Kulthum. Um Kulthum. Our master Umar, he wanted to get the blessing of marrying a woman from the Earl of the Prophet So he asked our master Ali to give him his daughter Umm Kulthum, the granddaughter of the Prophet in marriage. Another example Another example is that Asma bint Umais was married for, to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib until his death. She bore his child Muhammad. Later our master Abu Bakr married her and had a son from her who was also named Muhammad. Then after the death of Abu Bakr, Ali married her. One day, her two sons, Muhammad, the son of Ja'far, and Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr, mentioned boastfully the merits of their fathers. Ali told her, be the judge between them, because she was previously married to Ja'far, Ali's brother, and then later to Abu Bakr. She said, she said, I never saw a young man who had better manners than Ja'far. And I never saw an old man who had better manners than Abu Bakr. Ali radiallahu anhu, he laughed 
and said and asked her, then what did you leave for me? Meaning, where do I fit? Ali was not mad at her for praising Abu Bakr or for praising Jafar. May Allah raise their ranks. This is a sign of the great love that they had for one another. Nonetheless, there are some people who do not hold their tongues from cursing the companions who supported the Prophet ﷺ and who transmitted this religion to us. My dearest brothers and sisters, Imam an Nawawi in Al Adhkar mentioned that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, Ma shay'un ahaqqu bisijni min al lisan. This means nothing deserves imprisonment more than the tongue. Various scholars spoke at great length about the issues related to the tongue to highlight for Muslims the importance of controlling their tongue, of controlling this organ. Other scholars, they said, مَثَلُ lisan, مَثَلُ sab'i, إِنْ لَمْ تُوثِقْهُ عَدَى عَلَيْكَ This means the tongue is like a beast. The tongue, it's like a beast. If you do not tie it up, if you do not tie it up, it attacks you. It attacks you. Various scholars, my dearest brothers and sisters, spoke at length about the issues related to this tongue to highlight to emphasize to us the importance of keeping control of this organ. For example, Imam Dhunun al-Misri, who lived about 1,200 years ago, when asked, when asked about the one who controls and protects his heart the most, he replied, the one who controls his tongue the most, the one who controls his tongue the most. Allah made the tongue as a witness to what is in the heart. As it was mentioned by the scholars of Islam, words of goodness reflect what is in the heart. Just as sinful and blasphemous words reflect what is in the heart. We ask Allah to protect us from committing the sins of the tongue. May Allah enable us to prepare for ourselves for the day of judgment and to use these endowments that Allah bestowed upon us with sincerity and in obedience. My dearest brothers and sisters, I hope you can join me for the next episode of Keys to Paradise. And inshallah, I will continue to talk about the sins of this organ, the sins of the tongue. And Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.